Good morning, church. How y'all doing this morning? Y'all doing good? Yeah, man, isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord this morning? For some of you, you might be newer to our church. You might be like, who's this guy who's got all this energy, just bouncing all over the place? Well, my name is Pastor Desmond. I'm the discipleship pastor here at First Assembly. I'm excited to bring the word of God to all of you today. Amen? Awesome. Cool. So, hey, one of our uh, things that we do here is I provide pastoral leadership to all of our discipleship groups, our care groups, and also our foundation's discipleship classes. So, if you you are looking to get involved in some type of discipleship group or discipleship class, uh, connect with me. I'd love to get you plugged in. And also, if you say, hey, man, I'm interested in potentially leading a discipleship group, we have an onboarding process to help with that. All right? Amen. This mic's a little loud. Let me see something real quick. Let me see. Seth, I might switch to the, uh, the handheld. Let's see. Check, check. I'll put Testing. It sounds better. I'm not blowing your eardrums yet. All right, awesome. All right, cool. Say so. One of our uh, things we do for our discipleship is we read through the Bible together uh, throughout the year. We're in the Gospel of Matthew right now, as in our discipleship groups and as a church. And so each week, one of the discipleship opportunities that we get to give uh, people is we allow people to share a two-minute message on the scripture memory verse for that week, right? And so the scripture memory verse for this week is Matthew five sixteen. And so this week, our person that will be sharing on the two-minute verse is Brennan. Fl- can we give it up for Brennan Fluke as he comes on up and shares? Come on, Brennan. Awesome. Get out your way. Move the mic there. I got you. Might have to help him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just hold on. Just a moment. Give me one second. Struggling here. Give me a minute. Bless it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Daryl. He loves me. All right. Go ahead. All right. Good morning. All right. Y'all feel that? Because you're about to. <laughs> All right. So the verse is Matthew 5:16. I'm reading out of NLT. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Right. And this verse is basically saying that the authority. We have, we have the authority and we can give this unto all the others around us. And the more and more we fill ourselves up with the word, the more and more we read our Bibles, the more and more we pray, the more and more we do all these things for the Lord, the brighter and brighter our light to shine. And I think of it as a light bulb, like a light bulb. You start off dim, but the more and more and more you praise God and you more and more you go unto God, you will shine brighter. And with this being said, you got to think about it. The more and more you just, let me think real quick. We got this, right? And that I'm so sick and tired of hearing people say they're sick and tired because everybody's complaining and saying these things. People are out there suffering from depression, hatred, betrayal, all these things, anxiety, But I'm sick and tired of hearing people say they're sick and tired because guess what? We're not doing anything about it. We are sitting here and watching these people and we'd rather sit at home and sit on our butts all day instead of thinking and helping others. And when we can make a change for the world in a better place. Man, I don't even have to give the sermon no more, Brennan. That boy got some preaching him, huh? Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Well, I, I just, I just want to camp on that for just a little second before we get into the message today. I want to tell you guys why am I so passionate about discipleship. I've been walking with the Lord for 18 years now. Why am I so passionate about discipleship? It's because I wouldn't be standing in front of you here today if it wasn't for the many men and women of God that God had placed in my life to disciple me. I remember times as a teenager, I'm thankful, I'm in a a sense of gratitude this morning. I thank God for people like Josh and Kelly Carlson in the crowd when I was a teenager. They poured into me for years after years after years. I thank God for people like Bobby Richard, the pastor of one church who discipled me as a a young adult. And I thank God for people like Jeannie Mayo when I went off to Bible college. She poured into me in that season of my life. I thank God for people like Terry Baldwin, the pastor of Faith Outreach in Rochester, Indiana, where I was at recently, that he poured his life into me. And I thank God for the recent people. 
people in my life, Pastor Sh J Shannon and Pastor Joe and Dr. Kevin Harrison, who are currently mentoring me and discipling me. I wouldn't be where I'm at without the people that God has placed in my life in these last 18 years. I don't know if I would have made it. Because you can't walk this Christian life alone. You can't try to walk this thing and be a loner. You need somebody that's, that's checking on you, keeping you accountable, that's pushing you, pushing you towards Christ and causing you to be more like Jesus. You need people that's going to tell you the tough things you need to hear whenever you're going off the wrong path. I'm here to tell you today, discipleship is important and we lost this value. We lost this value. We're just more worried about attending on Sunday mornings, but we don't want to go deeper in our faith. We don't want to grow up in Christ. We're more, we're more worried about let me just show up and check off my box. Then man, help, let me get, go deeper in the gifts of the Spirit. Let me go deeper in the Word of God. I am so grateful for the people that God has placed in my life because I wouldn't be where I'm at today. That's why I'm passionate about discipleship because I can give away everything that was given to me these last 18 years. It's a privilege it's not a job for me to work at the church. It's a calling and it's a privilege to disciple people and to equip people to do the work of the ministry. That's it. We've lost the value of discipleship. It's so important. Don't undermine it. Don't, don't just say, oh, I could, I could disciple myself. No. Discipleship is important. Matthew 28, 19 says, go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not a church that's trying to command you to do it. Jesus commanded it. It's the great command, not the great suggestion, right? It's a command from Jesus. So we have to wake up and prioritize discipleship again. Amen? All right, I want y'all to catch that. That's not even my sermon yet. <clears throat> All right, let's pray because I believe the Holy Ghost is going to move in this place. Bow our heads, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, God. God, we thank you for what you're doing already in this house, God. I pray hearts would be like fertile soil today, God, that the seed that goes forth, God, would produce huge fruit, God. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, that you would break the back of spiritual apathy in this house, uh, that you would break the back of complacency in this house, God, that you would break the back, Lord God, of a lethargicness in our relationship with God. Father, I pray that you would breathe life upon your people today, God. Wake them up out of their complacency. Wake them up out of their apathy. God, set your people on fire for the things of God. That they be sold out for your purposes. They be sold out for your cause. Lord, wake up your sleeping church. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Everybody say amen. amen. Come on, come on. Let's get into that word today. Let's get into that word today. Holy Ghost about to do some things. I believe it. He's been speaking to me all throughout the week. The title of my sermon today is The Symptoms of Spiritual Apathy. We're going to be talking about the topic of spiritual apathy apathy in the life of the believer in the life of the church. We're going to be looking at three passages of scripture. We're going to look at two churches in Revelations that dealt with symptoms of spiritual apathy. We're going to look at a group of believers in the book of Hebrews that dealt with spiritual apathy. And today, I want you to really look deep inside your heart. I really want you to look deep inside yourself and say, is there symptoms of spiritual apathy in my walk with the Lord right now? Is there places that have become cold? Is there places that have become lukewarm? Because God wants to reignite a fire in you today for the things of God. Let's go ahead and look at the definition of what spiritual apathy is. Are you ready? I don't know if you are. Let's see. It says this. Spiritual apathy is a feeling, uh, it's a disinterest, it's, it's, a, it's a numbness towards the things of God. Did you catch that? It's a, it's a lack of interest, it's a lack, it's an indifference towards the things of God. Your heart has become cold, you're disinterested, you're checked out. It's a loss of passion and fervor for the things of God and for spiritual matters. This is the definition of spiritual apathy. It's a place where you're no longer motivated, you're no longer inspired, you're no longer excited about spiritual things. Spiritual apathy can affect any believer's life if you let it creep in. Spiritual apathy is a place where you're disengaged in spiritual things. You're checked out. You're unconcerned about the things of God. You have an attitude like, I really don't care. No desire, no passion for spiritual things or spiritual matters. Spiritual apathy. Today we're going to look inside our hearts. Has it crept in my life? Has it crept in the church? We're going to look at that. Today, today I'm going to be, we're going to start out in Revelations chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, verses 2 through 4. All right, I want to give a little, little background, a little context on the church of Ephesus. 
So the church of Ephesus was this wealthy city. It was a church that Paul talked about in Ephesians that they were known for their love for God and their love for people. And the church of Ephesus, it was also a pagan city. It was a pagan city where the Greek goddess Artemis was worshipped. And, 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 and so they was dealing with persecution. They was dealing with idol worship. They were dealing with all kind of different things in that day and in that culture. And what happens was there was a guy named Demetrius. He was a silversmith. And this goddess was recorded in Acts 19. The silversmith Demetrius. Demetrius, he was the one that was what he was getting all the silver shrines together, manufacturing them, and getting his craftsmen to form this Greek goddess, Artemis. And what happened is Paul came on the scene and busted up his ministry. Paul came in and said, These handmade gods that you are making are not really gods. And the Demetrius was so worried that Artemis, the, the Greek god, would lose his influence to the point where they started a riot in Acts chapter 19. They went to the amphitheater, they started worshiping the Greek god Artemis, but guess what happens? Paul's two of his co-laborers got taken to the amphitheater and Paul went to try to get his friends but the believers like no we don't want you to risk your life this was what was going on in the church of Ephesus they were also dealing with false teachers false apostles and that they claiming to be true apostles of God but they weren't really true apostles of God and so this is the the status and what the church of Ephesus was going through so as we get to Revelation chapter 2 we'll understand why Jesus is commending them let's go ahead in Revelation chapter 2 uh, verse 2 he says this, I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patience endurance. He's telling the church of Ephesus, good job. I've seen you patiently endure affliction. I've seen you patiently endure suffering for my sake. He says, I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who are apostles but are not. He's saying that, hey, I know you don't tolerate these false apostles with their heresy and false doctrines. You have exposed their heresy. You haven't tolerated is what he's saying to the church of Ephesus. Let's continue you. You have patiently, verse 3, suffered for me without quitting. So he's saying, I commend you for this. This is a commend. I commend you, church, for what? Bearing persecution for my name's sake and not wavering and not giving up and serving me and for the cause of the gospel. He's commending them. But guess what? He changes up his conversation. When we get to Revelations 2-4, he changes it to a rebuke. He rebukes the church of Ephesus. Listen to what he says here. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. So what is he talking about there? That Greek word is agape love. And what he's talking about right there, he's saying the love that you had for God and for other people has grown cold. You got in a, a, a religious formality. You did all these good things. You exposed false doctrine. You did all these religious activities. But your love for me has grown cold. It's not like it used to be. So today I ask you this question. Spiritual apathy might be present in your life. If you're just a person that's going through the motions in your walk, but your love and your fervency for Jesus and for people has diminished. Are you picking up what I'm putting down this morning? You might have some spiritual apathy in your life if you're just going through the motions. I came to church this week. I served in children's ministry. I put my tithe. But really, there's no fervency. You have no intimacy with God. Don't replace serving ministry with intimacy with God. Don't replace serving in ministry with intimacy with God. That was the issue with Martha and Mary. What happened? Martha was worried about serving and preparing the dinner for Jesus. But Jesus was like, Mary got it. Because she's coming to sit at my feet. I want to speak to her. I want relationship, communion with her. And see what happens in the church, we become apathetic with our relationship with God and our love for God and our love for people. Jesus said, love is the greatest. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is the greatest. It doesn't matter how much you serve. It doesn't matter how much you do all these hard things. That's a good thing. But God has said, I'm more concerned about your intimate relationship with me. I want to talk to you. I want to pour into you. I want you to be in on fire for that more than how much Christian duties you can do throughout the week. How much good works you could do in your own strength. How much good works you could do in your own ability. God is saying that you need to, he wants to reignite a fire in your relationship with God. Again, some of you in here, if you're honest, you're cold. You're dying on the inside. You're coming here every week after week. But God wants to reignite a fire for your relationship with him. Again, that where God's love is the priority, not just checking off my religious duty for the week. Come on, church, it's time for us to wake up this morning. It's time for us to wake up this morning. God wants to speak today to his house. Flip with me to Hebrews chapter 5. I'm going to be in verses 11 through 14. Give a little context on Hebrews so we can understand what's being said here in the text. The book of Hebrews, 
The writers unidentified. Some apostles, scholars say they think it's Apostle Paul, but there's no certainty. But we know that he's writing to a group of Jewish Christians. What is the purpose of Hebrews? Why is he writing to the Hebrews? Because the Hebrews were dealing with pressure and persecution to revert back to Judaism. Judaism. The works of the law, keeping all the rituals and the works of the law, and there would be a pressure to go back to that. And the theme throughout Hebrews, the writer is saying Jesus Christ is greater than the old Levitical priesthood. Jesus Christ is the eternal high priest. He replaces the old covenant of the priesthood and how they would sacrifice animal after animal after animal on behalf of the sins of Israel, and it was only a temporary covering. But he says Jesus is the eternal high priest. He is the perfect lamb. He is the perfect sacrifice. There's no more need for the old Levitical priesthood system. And this was the message throughout Hebrews that he was trying to get across to the Jewish believers in that day who were struggling to revert back to Judaism. Are you picking up what I'm putting down so far? And so what happens is when we get to Hebrews chapter 5, What happens when we get to Hebrews, the the writer starts to talk about this priesthood, how Jesus Christ, God qualified him to be the perfect high priest. He was sinless without sin. He was sinless without sin. He lived as a human on his earth. He was fully God and fully man. And then he tells him, he says, as he starts to talk about this subject, he puts it on pause. Why does the writer put it on pause? He tells us in verses 11 through 14, now read with me. There's much more we would like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. That word dull in the Greek is to be sluggish, is to be lazy, is to be slack. So these believers were lazy and and sluggish in their learning of the word of God. And guess what? They didn't grow up spiritually. They stayed in a place of spiritual immaturity because of their spiritual apathy and spiritual laziness. And so the writer said, I can't go deeper on this subject of of, of Jesus Christ being the eternal high priest because you're not ready for that. That's solid food. Let's continue to see what he says in verse 12. He says this. He says in verse 12, he says, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Oh, that's a lot of people in the church. Come on, come on, come on. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. So basically he's saying you've been saved for such a long time that you, you should have grown up spiritually. That's what he said. It's time for some of you here to grow up spiritually. But guess what's cop- guess what stopped you from growing up spiritually? Spirit, spiritual apathy and spiritual laziness. Because guess what? Spiritual apathy and spiritual laziness equals, it keeps you in a place of spiritual immaturity. You will never grow up in Christ. You will never grow up in his fullness. As long as you are apathetic to the word of God, as long as you have no desire to grow deeper in the scriptures, as long as you have no desire to to be discipled, as long as you have no desire to learn the word of God well enough to teach others, you will stay in a place of spiritual infancy, a beginning level in your faith. As long as apathy is present in your life, it will rob you of spiritual growth. It will rob you of going deeper with God. It will rob you of those things. We have to wake up. We have to grow up in Christ. We have to want uh, uh, the word that was given here, a hunger. Uh, My spirit was so stirred because my prayer all this week, I said, God, I pray people would be ready to be done with apathy in their life and hunger after the things of God again. And hunger for a fire for his word. And hunger for a fire for a fiery fiery hot prayer life. We got to wake up, church, to the things of God and hunger for him again. Complacency. Spiritual apathy. Let's continue. He says, you're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. It's a metaphor. Babies, milk is a metaphor referring to a baby Christian, a new Christian in the faith that don't have a lot of skills in the scriptures. He says, you need to go back and learn the basics of the faith. He says here, for someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know what is right. I just explained that. Let's go to verse 14. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Solid food is a metaphor to describe the mature Christian who has experience in the word of God, who has studied the scriptures, who has trained himself in the word of God to grow up in Christ. That's what that reference is to. Solid food is for the mature believer who can handle the deeper teachings of the scriptures. And who can discern right from wrong. The whole meaning of this passage, the writer is trying to get these believers to grow up spiritually. They have been spiritually apathetic. They have been spiritually lazy towards the word of God. And because of that, they're in a place of spiritual immaturity. 
And he goes on in Hebrews chapter 6, and he says, grow up in Christ. Leave the basic teachings about Jesus Christ behind. It's time for you to grow up. So what is the danger of spiritual apathy? If you have symptoms of spiritual apathy, you might not have a desire or appetite for the word of God like you once had. If you have spiritual apathy in your life, you might not want to grow up in the word. You might want to just let me do a little devotion one time this week, but that's enough for me. Let me go ahead and just check off my box. I prayed a few times this week. That's enough for me. Whenever spiritual apathy is there, you have a lack of interest. You have a lack of desire for the things of God. Are you in a place in your life, examine yourself where there's things that have spiritual apathy has crept in. Examine your walk with the Lord today because he wants to set you free in Jesus' name. Amen. Flip with me to Revelations chapter 3. Revelations chapter 3. Come on, come on. Y'all getting something this morning? Come on, come on. Revelations chapter 3. This is one of my favorite verses because it's so misinterpreted. I'm going to have fun with this one today. Church of Laodicea. Most people, I say, yeah, verses 15 through 16, all right. So when most people look at Revelations chapter 3, they think of the, the water metaphor of cold, hot, and lukewarm as Jesus saying the, the water of the hot metaphor is somebody that's on fire for Jesus Christ, brother. He's sold out for the Lord. And then other people look at the water metaphor of being cold as referring to uh, somebody as a non-believer. They're cold-hearted, cold-hearted towards Christ. But that's a bad interpretation. That's bad theology. I'm explaining it in a minute. Because why would Jesus tell a Christian, I'd rather you to go back and be cold in a non-believing state when the Bible tells me all throughout scriptures that God desires that no man should perish but all come to repentance. God desires all men to be saved, right? He's not going to say, oh, I want you to be a crowd. I want some people to be on team Jesus, be hot for Jesus, but, and I'd rather some of you just don't serve me, uh, be cold, be dead, and, and don't love me. That's not what he was saying in that passage. Y'all ready to learn today? We're going to do a little Bible study today. Let's do a little Bible study today. We got to, how we understand this verse is we have to understand the cultural and historical context of the city of Laodicea. What was going on in that day? The church of Laodicea was a wealthy city, a prosperous city, but there was one issue that they had. They had a bad water supply. They had a bad water supply. So the church of Laodicea was a city that was in the middle of Heropolis and another city called Colossae. And so guess what happened is, they, since they didn't have a water supply, they had to borrow from these other cities. So they borrowed from the cities of Harapolis, which was, guess what, known for its hot springs water. They believed the water temperature was about 90-something degrees and to where the point was people would bathe in it and it would be like a, a medicine and a healing for their body. And Colossae was known for their cold water, uh, cold water fresh springs that the water was cold enough to drink. It was refreshing, so it was useful for the city. The hot water was useful for bathing for the body. It was clean, pure, hot water. The cold water in Colossae was good for drinking. It was refreshing. So these two metaphors are positive connotations. The only negative, negative connotation in that passage is the lukewarm reference. So this is what Jesus was saying here. He was saying basically, are you paying attention? I'm going somewhere. They would get the water to travel to Laodicea. By the time the water traveled to Laodicea, it became lukewarm temperature. That's what he's getting at. By the time the water would travel to the city of Laodicea, it would become lukewarm temperature. So guess what happened, church? Guess what happened? Jesus, when he's saying, I'd rather you be hot like the hot, this is what he's saying, like the hot springs water because that water is useful in its city. It's effective. It's useful for the people that are, when they bathe in it, it's like a medicine. It heals their body. And then he says, I'd rather you be cold like this refreshing ice cold water that you can drink in your service to the Lord. That's what he's talking about. In your service to the Lord, church. But he says, you are like your own water. You are nasty. You, I want to vomit you out your mouth. You are disgusting. And he's talking about their spiritual condition. He's talking about their spirit. He's talking about you are not committed to serving me. What was happening in that day? They were so caught up in consumerism, in wealth. They basically lived off of their wealth, and they felt like I'm awesome and prosperous on the outside. But on the inside, spiritually, they were a mess. They were a mess. They were a mess. And guess what happens whenever spiritual apathy. So, so what he's teaching in that passage, he says, I want you to be hot like the hot springs water and cold like cold springs water. I want you to be like these water. They were useful in their city. They were useful for service in their city. I want you to be the church of Jesus Christ that is useful for the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Okay. All right. Drop a little knowledge on y'all today. You learned something. All right. Let's continue. Um, 
So how have we come to a place of spiritual apathy in the text of the Laodiceans? How do they become spiritually apathetic? They begin to place money, their money, their wealth, all those things above service to the kingdom of God. So how does that apply to us? That basically means you might have misplaced priorities today. Every time the church is wanting you to serve, come on, I'm going somewhere. Every time the church is wanting you to volunteer, you got an excuse. I got this baseball game. I got this thing going on. You have no heart to contribute to the kingdom of God. You have no heart to contribute to the kingdom of God. You have this idleness of busyness. You have this idleness, oh, I got this and that and that going on. But every time somebody says, come and do this outreach with us. Come and serve here. Come and pray. You're the last one to show up. This right here could be spiritual apathy towards serving in the kingdom of God, just like the church. It can apply to us today. God wants his church to be fervent and to be like hot and cold water that is useful for service to the kingdom. Not so caught up in our own agendas. Not so caught up in our own lifestyles. Not so caught up in our own pleasures of this world. Because our time is getting cut short, church. Our time is getting cut short. Short. And we're wasting too much time when people are dying. You know why I love being a hospice chaplain along with working for the church? It's because I can never become lukewarm in that field. People are dying every day. I get to step in and change their situation. I get to tell them there's hope in the gospel. That you can have eternal life if you're born again. I get an opportunity every day. I can't get lukewarm whenever I'm sitting around somebody about to die right in front of me. I love it because it keeps me on my toes. I get to stay fiery hot for the gospel. I keep my mouth open about Jesus in this field and I love it. And I do damage to the enemy. I give a blow in the black eye to the devil. I don't play with him. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on. Y'all getting something this morning? Get a sip of my water right quick. Mm. We going somewhere. Stay with me. I'm not a long-winded pe- preacher, so we might get out a little early today. Say, bless the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. All right. I'm not. I'm not. Everybody knows that. All right, cool. <clears throat> Let's see. Where am I? <laughs> All right, cool. I lost my train of thought. So basically, this is the question you have to ask yourself. This is the question you have to ask yourself <clears throat> today. Is there any area in my life, remember the definition of spiritual apathy. It's a coldness towards the things of God. It's a lack of passion, a lack of fervency towards the things of God. Has there anything in your life that's become cold? Maybe it's your prayer life. Maybe it's your worship. Maybe it's being in the Bible. Maybe it's evangelizing. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When's the last time you led somebody to the Lord? That's the question. I want you to ask the deep questions today because if there's some complacency and apathy in your life, God wants to remove it out of your life. God wants to resurrect life on the inside of you where you're burning for him, where you're on fire for him again. He wants you to have zeal and passion for his house, zeal and passion for his people, zeal and passion for his work in the world. Has that died in you? It's time to wake up, church. Because guess what? As long as the church is apathetic in its prayer life, as long as the church is apathetic uh, and and we we don't want to pray for revival, we want revival, but we're not willing to do the work. We want revival. We want our communities to be changed, but we're not willing to pray for revival. We're not willing to pray for the lost. We're not willing to get out of our comfort zones to go and reach those that are dying, that are hurting, just like Brennan said. We complain about our world is a mess, but we're not willing to do anything about it. We complain about all the problems in the world, but we're not willing to do anything about it. We're so apathetic towards the things of God. We just want to do the bare minimum. So can I just squeeze my way into heaven? That's a wasteful life. That is a wasteful life. That is a, let me say it again, a wasteful life. God didn't just save you to just sit on a seat and warm up a seat every Sunday. Come on, church. It's time to get busy about the kingdom of God. It's time to get busy about souls. It's time to get busy about praying. We've lost that fervency for those things. We've lost our fervency for souls. And we've gotten caught up in our little Christian bubbles. We're more worried about coming to church and fellowship and then praying before the service. We just want to talk about what we were watched on Stranger Things or what I'm doing this week. Instead of coming to meet with God, wake up, sleeping church. Wake up by the power of God. Look at the signs of the times we're in. Our world is falling apart. Our world is falling apart. We need to do something about it. We got to get out of our apathy, though, to get there. We got to get out of our complacency to get there. Wake up, church. Wake up to the things of God. 
Reignite your passion. Lay your apathy at the altar today. You will have an opportunity to do that. Thank you, Lord. I remember one of the times in my life, and it's very rare, because those that are in this crowd, Daryl Jackson, Josh and Kelly Carlson, people that, Corey Malbrew, Lori, that have been knowing me for a long time. What I'm preaching to you today, I've been living the last 18 years of my life. Am I perfect? No, I'm not perfect. I'm not bragging. I'm not up here trying to be braggadocious. I'm not perfect. But this message that I'm preaching, I've been living this way. Because whenever I got saved, I told the devil I was radical in the world, but I'm going to be radical for Christ. I'm going to be on fire for Jesus. I was radical when I was partying. I was radical when I was getting drunk. I was radical when I was sleeping around. I was radical with all those things. But whenever I got saved, I told the devil. I put him on notice. And I said, devil, you in trouble. Devil, you in trouble. Devil, you in trouble. I told him that, and I've been living my life. The last 18 years, that way I'm going to continue until Jesus calls me home. Some of you in here, there was once a time, I'm speaking to somebody, Holy Spirit's drawing you. Some of you, you remember that time? You couldn't stop telling people about Jesus and now you barely can open your mouth. God wants to re reunite a fire in you today. God wants to blow on those coals. God wants to wake you up out of your apathy today. Will you let him? Will you let him? Do you want it bad enough? Because he's here today. He is here, church. He is here. We have to wake up to the things of God. And God, give me a fresh fire for you again. A zeal for the things of God again. Thank you, Lord. Come on, uh, worship team, come on up. I told y'all, we about to go do some business with God. Thank you, Lord. We about to, woo. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Altar ministry team, get ready. We about to lay hands. Uh, Peter, get some catches, please. Like, line it once we had the altar team. People, because we, yeah, we, we about to go in. About to go in. Some people about to get that fire reignited. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, da, 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 ba, ba, ba. I just want to pray. If you have a prayer language, start praying in the spirit right now. We'll sing where you're at. Come on, Holy Spirit. Oh, 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 right now. Reveal it, God. Reveal it right now where that apathy is. So they can surrender. Come on, start praying in the spirit. Pray like you mean it. It's not a time to uh, coast. Come on, Holy Spirit. Breathe. Breathe on your people. Breathe life. So cold, la 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 ba 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 ba. Come on, Jesus, come on. Hey, 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 So cold, la 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 la. He's here. He's here. He wants to set you free. He wants to breathe life on that relationship again. He wants to breathe life on those cold areas, those places, those places of stagnancy. He wants to breathe life on it again. Seka da 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 la la. Will you let him? Will you let him? So cold, la la. Come on, start praying, church. Start praying. So come on, start meeting with him right now. Seka da 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 la ba 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 ba. Hee 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 hee. So cold, la 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 ba ba ka. Hee 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 hee. Altar ministers team, make your way. Prayer team, come up front. I need some prayer warriors up here. Come on, we're about to pray heaven on these people. Come on, come on, come on. Make your way. Keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. This is the call this morning. This is where we're going this morning. Mm, come on, Jesus. Spirit. If you're in the house today, and if any of the message resonated with you, and you say, as you were speaking, the Holy Spirit was spotlighting places of apathy in my life where I've grown cold towards the things of God. I've grown cold in my prayer life. I've grown cold. I don't even have a desire to really be at church. I barely squeeze through the doors on Sundays. If you see any type of spiritual apathy that is present right now in your life, and you say, I want to be done with it. I want to surrender it to the altar. I want a fresh fire. I want a fresh baptism today. The opportunity is available to you. And there's another group of people in here if you never gave your life to Jesus Christ, the Bible says you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's no other way. Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. There's no other man that comes to the Father except through him. And today, if you haven't made that decision, this altar call is for you as well. We have plenty of qualified ministers to lead you into surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. And then there's a third call today. Our, our baptism tank is full today. If you feel led by the Spirit of God to get water baptized, because Scripture commands us to in obedience to the Lord. If you feel led by the Spirit of God to get water baptized, you'll be able to see Miss Eva will be right over there. She'll collect your information. She's going there now. And we'd love to water baptize you today by the end of the service. But right now I want to fo focus on that first group. 
If you say, you know what, Pastor Desmond, as you were speaking today, I, I heard another voice. His name is Holy Spirit. And he was spotlighting things in my life where it's grown cold. He's spotlighting apathy in my walk with the Lord. I see it present and I want to be done with it. I want you to make your way to the front right now. Right now. Right now. Come. Come. If you say, I want a fresh baptism. I want a fresh zeal for God. Come. Do not wait. Do not sit down. Come on up. Come on up right now. There he is. Come on. Come on up. If you say, I want a fresh fire for God. I want those cold areas to become hot again. Don't wait. Don't worry about your neighbor. Come on up and find someone to pray with you today. Come on up. Hallelujah. I know there's more out there. There's more. Come on up if you feel. If you're honest with yourself today. Don't leave out of this place changed. God wants to light a fire in you. He wants to give you a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're here today to minister to you. Let me pray and dismiss the rest of you here, but the altars are open. The altars are open. Let me pray and bless you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word today, God. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are present here. We thank you, God, that you're about to destroy apathy in the lives of the believers, God. I thank you that your sleeping church is becoming alive. I thank you that you're lighting a fire in the people of God again. I thank you, Lord, that you're giving them a fresh zeal for you and their relationship with you, Father. Father, I pray right now, those that are hesitating to come, draw them to the altar, God. Draw them to the altar today, Father, by your spirit, oh God. We praise you for these things. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Amen.